to college 24 years ago now. I, I left uh, New Mexico and went out to, to Dallas for college. And I spent the next 20 years away from New Mexico. And there was actually one consistent thing, and it's going to sound crazy, but there was one consistent thing about me in that 20 years that I was away. I, I constantly had this, this itch to come back and hang out in New Mexico. Now, I don't know if you're anything like me, if you grew up here, uh, but you grew up calling New Mexico the land of entrapment, right? right? You grew up calling it the land of entrapment because you're ready to go, right? You're ready to take off. And I was that kid. I, I was ready to take off. I was ready to, 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 to go away. And, and uh, my friend that was my roommate my freshman year of college and I, we both grew up in Albuquerque. We were really good friends. Uh, we went to college in Dallas. And we did something weird because we both seemed to have this itch. We would sit, and when other people and their roommates would, would talk, they would talk about, about girls or about parties, or they would talk about, you know, politics or all those things in college, and we just talked about New Mexico. I don't know why we did, right, because everything in New Mexico wants to kill you, right? The, the cactus and the rattlesnakes and the people, they all want to kill you, right? This is just the reality. Um, but we both just loved it. We, we, we loved the mountains, and I, I actually for years, every six months or so, would find an excuse just to come back and, and hang out in the mountains. Um, one, one of my excuses, actually, when my, my kids who are older now, when they were really little, we would drive through, uh, we had a state park in the town in Oklahoma we lived in, and the, the walls of this state park were 30 feet high. It was a canyon, right, with 30 foot high walls. And my kids, when they were three, four, five year olds, would talk about the big mountains that we were driving through. And I would correct them and be like, these are not mountains. And I would, I would we drag them to New Mexico just because I needed them to know what it could be like. I know it's crazy. I don't know why. But there was something in me that desired to have the cool air of the mountains and the, and, and the, the crisp mornings and the fall. You know, when you, you go outside and it's like 40 degrees and, and the air is clean and clear. And, and we just didn't have that where I was in Oklahoma. It was windy and it was hot. Actually, when Brandon called and he was talking to me about this job and he was talking to me about coming out here and trying to, to tell me about some of the cool things about here. He asked me, it was, uh, we were in, it was August and he said, so what's it like out there right now? And I said, well, it's about 105 and the wind is blowing and it's humid. And he said, just so you know, it's 68 and raining here right now. Yeah, it was, wasn't even fair for him to do that, right? There, there was something in me that even though I wasn't here, I actively desired to be here. Like I, I wanted to dwell in this, and it, the, the cool air of the mountains and everything, it, it was something that, that where my heart dwelled, it, it was where I wanted to be. My heart was dwelling in this place even when I wasn't here. Last week we started a series, we're going to continue today, it was called The One Thing That Changes Everything. And, and the series is built around the idea of God's word, and allowing God to transform us by his word. Last week Brandon talked about encountering God, and the encounters with God, and how how amazing it is when we actually do encounter him. Today, what I want to do is talk about dwelling in God's word. What happens when we actually live in God's word and stay in God's word. If, last week, we actually started uh, a, a time of study that we're going to be going through all month. Um, and we've been going through the book of Mark. If you haven't got a chance to get started with that yet, you can go to the VV.Church app, and there's a place to, to get the link to the Bible app to be able to do that. Or there are some sheets right outside the door here. I can get you some afterwards to be able to jump into our study. We want to study God's word together every day this month. And so uh, grab hold of that. But today what we're going to do is we're going to jump into Psalm chapter 1. Uh, Psalm 1, um, which is wisdom writ literature that was written a couple thousand years ago. Um, actually, 3,000 years ago. Studying God and who he is. And in Psalm 1, uh, the very first psalm, we're going to be looking at that one there today. It's six verses long. So go ahead and turn there. If you don't have a Bible, you can have the one in the seat in front of you. Uh, you can grab that. It looks like this and turn to page 448. You can actually have it and take it home and mark it up. It's yours. Highlight it. We want everybody to get into the Word. But in Psalm 1, uh, we run into this right here. And it talks about, first, the broken ways of this world and ultimately how there's something better. So let's take a look. Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. So the man who is blessed who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked or, or stand in, the, in, the, in the, the place of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers. This is a, an image of a downward spiral, all right? Now, when I, wanna, I wanna paint this for us today because I think the reason that the writer gives this to us in this way, the reason that God empowered the writer to share this with us is because the way of this world 
is built around these things. You, you start in one place and it moves you to something else. And the first part it says here is walk in the counsel of the wicked or walk in the counsel of the ungodly. The word wicked here, it's also translated ungodly in other places, is built around the idea of, of an unbalanced or an unsettled life, a life without direction. It says, blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of those who don't have direction. In the counsel of those who are undirected by God, the ones who just are guided by whatever it is that they feel in that moment. And it, it paints this picture as you see walking and then standing and then sitting, of it moving you to a place uh, where you are sitting in this dark place, but it starts by finding your purpose based on what the unsettled of this world teaches us to do. Now, as we talk about this and as we think about this, we know we're constantly being discipled by this world to believe certain things, right? We're constantly being told by this world that, to believe that your way is the most important way, right? Whatever you feel right now, it's what you need to go get right now. Whatever it is that you think is, is, is what matters, whatever matters to you, that's what really matters. And you need to take it and you need to, to make it happen. But the problem is, and we know that this is the case, those things are fickle. Those things change. And how many of us, if we're honest, have, have thought that something that we were going to get, maybe it was a relationship, or, or maybe it was a job, or maybe it was a degree, or maybe it was children, we thought, if I can just get that, it's going to give me all the value that I'm ever going to need. It's going to make me happy. And then it disappointed us. Anybody experience that disappointment? Right? We're discipled to believe these things, and then we find that it doesn't work. The counsel of the ungodly teaches us that's what you should want. But what happens then is this. It says this, if you look at the next part, it says it, it moves from walking in the counsel of the ungodly to standing in the way of sinners. And this is what it means when we start to settle in. Now, sin, I, need, I, I say the word sin, and I know how this works. I need you guys to open your ears for a second, because here's what happens. We only use the word sin in church, right? And you don't ever hear it outside of church. But in church, if you've grown up in church, you've heard the word sin roughly 11 billion times. Right? You've heard it a ton. And, and so when you hear the word sin in church or stand in the, in the, in the, in the place of sinners, it, there's a good chance that you just kind of tone it out because you hear it all the time. But the word sin means missing the mark on what God has created you to be. It means God created us to go this direction and we missed the mark of that. So uh, God creates us for good things and then we take the good things and we move them for bad. God created us to be able to communicate with each other. Right? We can communicate honestly with each other, but then we start to lie so that we can get what we want out of the situation. Or, or God created us to trust his provision, and sooner or later we get tired of waiting for him to provide, so we steal for ourselves. God created us in these in ways, and, and what sin is, is it's missing that mark. And the reason that that matters is it destroys us. If we think about it for a second, we are a church who is made up of people who have either been in prison or probably should have been, right? Or we're a church of people who have a tendency to lie, or we're a church of people who have a tendency to, to be rude at the worst possible situations, selfish. Or a church that is built of people who realize we don't have it all together. It's actually one of the things I like about Valley View, is, is the fact that we are a people who understand that we don't have all of the answers. But when you think about the worst decisions that you've ever made, and that's what this passage is teaching us here. None of us ever set out to get there. Right? None of us ever said when we were 10 years old, someday I want to get married. And then two years later, I want to tell my spouse, I wish we had never got married because I hate you. Right? None of us ever set out to be addicted to substances. To, to be in a place where we couldn't go through a day without looking at things we didn't want to look at. But that place, that, that, that cycle happens because of the downward spiral of sin that we see right here. And it sees, if you look at the end of this verse, it says here, it says, walk in the counsel of the wicked, stand in the way of sinners, and ultimately sit in the seat of the scornful. The scornful are, are the people who not only are practicing sin, but find themselves making fun of others who aren't. I've been there. I've been in the place where the brokenness of sin is something that I got comfortable with. I remember when I was going to New Mexico State, I think I've shared this story before, 
I, I claimed Christ, but I acted like everybody else. And then these people actually walked up to me one time and they said, you know what I like about you, Jim? I love the fact that you're a Christian, but you act just like the rest of us. And I wore it as like the coolest badge of honor until I realized that I was just in the same place of death and darkness, and I was just as broken inside. You see, without even realizing it, we get comfortable with the brokenness of sin. We think there aren't any strings attached, but there are. Brandon says this a lot. I love this. Uh, sin will take you further than you want to go, cost you more than you want to pay, and keep you there longer than you want to stay. This is the reason why Psalm 1-1 starts this way, but it doesn't end that way. Look at verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his, in his law he meditates day and night. So it says the person who is blessed isn't the one who practices sin, but the person who is blessed is, who, is the one who delights in the law of the Lord and meditates on God's word day and night. Now, meditating on God's word, meditating on the law, we think of the law, and the law here, the word here for law is the word Torah, or Torah, and it's this idea of delighting in the teachings and the law of God. Putting those things and focusing those things in your heart. Now, when I say somebody who delights in the law, what I first picture is somebody who is like super legal about things and like every rule has to matter. I actually have one of my children. I'm not going to say which one, um, but one of my children is really good at picking up on hypocrisy. Like, I don't know if you have any kids that are that way, but like, why do you get to eat ice cream? And we don't get to have ice cream. Why do you get to go out to have dinner together and we don't get to do that? Why do you get to say, like, we don't, any, any of you guys that way? Or have no people that are that way? Like, you're really good at picking up on this stuff. When we see somebody who's delighting in the law of God, that's not necessarily what we're picturing. What we're picturing here, and what the writer is saying, is somebody who puts the word of God and the, the commands of God first and foremost in their heart. Now, does that mean we need to look at, like, the Ten Commandments and, and just think about those things all day long? Well, n no, not exactly. We don't build our lives built on, on following rules. But yes, for this purpose. I want to think through the Ten Commandments this morning, just for a moment, and think about why it is that focusing on that may change our hearts. What are the Ten Commandments? One God, right? There's only one God, serve Him only, right? Don't make any idols. Don't use the Lord's name in vain. The Sabbath, keep the Sabbath. Honor your father and mother. No adultery, no Lying, stealing, killing, and no coveting. I got all ten. I always feel good when I do that. I'm so afraid I'm going to get up here and be embarrassed. Like, uh, what was the last one? Um, so those things, if I focus on those things, is that going to make me a perfect person? No, it's not, right? But focusing on those things does a couple things. One, it directs my path towards where God wants me to go. But two, it also shows me how messed up I am. You see, Jesus talks about the Ten Commandments. And he says, if you've broken any of these in your heart, then you haven't kept them. Well, how many of you guys have mm, maybe took the Lord's name in vain or um, maybe not kept the Sabbath? Like you knew God wanted his time, you wanted time for God and God said no, or you knew God wanted you to have time with him and you're like, no, I've got my own. How many of you have lied? Anybody? Those of you who aren't raising your hand, right? Uh, how many of us have stolen, Right? How many of us have murdered somebody? I have. You see, Jesus says if you have harbored hate in your heart towards somebody else, basically wishing that that person didn't exist, you've murdered them in your heart. So how many of us have murdered somebody? Right? Jesus says if you looked at a woman lustfully with desire like that, that's not your wife, that's adultery. Jesus says, if you've looked at your neighbor's things and said, well, that person doesn't deserve that as much as I deserve that. How many of us, if we're honest, probably have broken all ten commandments? Right? I have. I have. And that's good to know. You know why? And this is the coolest part. Once I start to put God's word in my heart, once I start to think about the commands of God, what it does is it shows me that I don't have everything all together. The world tries to get you to believe, and you're going to try to believe yourself, that you have all things together. You, you, your, your way is right. Your way is good. Your way is true. What you want is good. But we know deep down inside, our biggest fear, most of us, our biggest fear in the world, is that people figure out one day that we're frauds. Right? Right? that we don't have it all together. We try. We try to look good. 
We try to act good. We try to talk well. We try to, to put on our best possible face. We try to make people understand that we're smart. But deep down inside, we know we don't have it all. What the Ten Commandments do, what the Word of God does, is it shows you that that's right, you don't. And God still loves you. You see, once you get to the place where you're actually delighting in the Word of God, what it does is it shows you, man, God has a better way, and you're going to fall short. And yet God still, God still desires you. Delighting in the, law, in the law of God makes us moldable, but it also shows us that we can't keep everything together. And look at verse 3, and we'll see how. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its, its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. So the person who delights in the law of God is, is like a tree that is planted by streams of water that doesn't wither when things dry up. It has leaves, and it's strong. It, proper, it prospers when everything else doesn't. You see, when you delight in the law of God, what happens is you start to bear fruit. There's a fruit that comes out of you that even in the hard seasons, it's going to be okay. I, I, I've experienced this, and this is why I think this is cool. This is going to sound petty or it's going to sound little, but I, it's, it's proof again of God's work. I am not a good driver. I'm just going to confess that to you guys right now. I'm just really not. I'm not a great driver. I'm not, I'm not good. I actually said that during the first service, and then my insurance agent was in here, and she's like, you really shouldn't be telling me these things. Um, but I'm, I'm just not a great driver. There's dings on my car. There's these, I've never been in a major accident. I've never caused a major accident, but I'm not a great driver. And I know this about myself. I would love to say that I am, but I'm really not. I sometimes make decisions I shouldn't make. A couple weeks ago, I was, I was sitting, at, trying to get onto 66, and there were cars coming both ways, and it was taking a long time. Any of you guys been there? And you're like, I get tired of waiting, and, and finally there was uh, three cars coming from my left about 100 yards up, and five cars coming from my right about 150 yards up, and I thought, this is my chance. So I, I gunned it, and I got out onto the road, and I cut right in front of somebody, and I looked at the guy's face, and it's somebody who's sitting in this room right now, <laughs> right? Um, and, and, I, and he looked at me with this, like, confused look, and uh, he may not have recognized me. I hope he didn't. He'd be all right, but I looked at him with this confused look, and I recognized him. And, I, and then there was a guy right behind him, and there was a guy right behind that. And the guy right behind that, I didn't recognize that guy, but I recognized the finger that he was showing me, right? I recognized that. And at that moment, at that moment, my first thought was, I'm going to make a U-turn. I'm going to drive up. I'm going to make sure that guy knows that I saw what it is that he was trying to show me. I'm going to put him in his place. I'm, I'm not going to put anybody in their place. But my first reaction was one in anger. How dare you? But this is the cool part. And this is going to sound, it's just important. I have been recently really striving to focus on putting God's word into my heart. And at that moment, I was actually reminded of the Ten Commandments, which sounds crazy. But I was reminded of the fact that, Jim, you don't have it all together. And that guy doesn't either. And it's okay. You don't have any right to run around and try and put that guy in his place when I'm still working on you. And I felt a peace come over me that nothing in this world would give. When you start to delight in the law of the Lord, when you start to, when you start to delight in the, in the word of God, when you start to get to know Jesus who died for you in your sins, you first have to understand what your sins are. But once you start to realize that you have sin, you realize, I need a Savior and once you realize that you need a Savior, you realize how great it is that Jesus died for you. And in that, the fruit that comes out of that is a fruit of peace. It says that it is like a tree that's planted by water that doesn't wither. It bears fruit. Now, we know what trees that wither look like. We live in New Mexico. Right? We know what it looks like when something doesn't have water and it just dies. But there's this tree between Truth or Consequences and Las Cruces, when I was going to school in Las Cruces, I would drive by this tree, and it was in the middle of nowhere. There was nothing else around except for a few choya cactus and this one tree that was growing up, and it was green, and it was full, and that's because it had a water source that you couldn't see. This is what the follower of God looks like. It's a person who has a source. It's not easy. 
that you have a source and it doesn't lead to death. When we delight in God's word, our hearts are much less drawn to the paths that lead to death. Most of us go through lives afraid of being found out as frauds, trying to move from thing to thing to thing, trying to find something that is going to satisfy us, and it never does. We try different things. We still get tempted. We think, I tried God's word. It didn't work. I, I tried these other things, and it still doesn't work. I don't know what to do. But when we simply find ourselves first and foremost starting in God's word and saying, okay, God, I'm just going to trust your will for my life. It's the only way that we're going to find a source that doesn't run dry. See, the satisfaction that comes from sin is, per is a perpetually moving target. And, and as we try to find these things, we try to find more affirmation or a different relationship or more substances or porn or anything else. Every time we go through it, it's never enough. And you know that that's the case. But the source of God's fulfillment doesn't move. When we lean, lean on God's goodness, he gives us strength like a peace, like a stream of water. Let's look at verses 4 and 5 again. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. This is the hardest part of the whole passage for me. Because it says that the wicked are like chaff. The wicked are like chaff that is blown away, that they're, 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 it's there for a little while and then it's just gone. You guys know what chaff is? All right. I've lived in Oklahoma for a while. I've actually seen chaff. I've, I've held it in my hands. Here's what happens. Uh, they grow wheat in Oklahoma, and, and chaff is something that happens on wheat. Uh, it, the, you get the, the, the stock from the wheat, and then you get these, these pods, right, that have the, have the little pieces of wheat inside them. They're, they're surrounded by this brown, flaky stuff that, that kind of grows around them to protect the wheat. What you'll do... And we actually had a, a wheat field, like five yards from the door of the church building that I worked at. And so sometimes I would go and I would just grab one of these little heads of wheat and I would rub my hands together because I wanted to look like a disciple. Actually, I rubbed my hands together because I was hungry. So you'd grab one of these little pods of wheat and you'd rub your hands together like this. And as you did it, you'd feel the, the kernels of wheat, which are like little pieces of rice. You'd feel them in your hands and you'd feel a crunching. And after you crunch your hands for a moment or two, you'd lift your hands up and the wind would blow or you'd blow on them. And all of the stuff that was surrounding the wheat would just blow off in the wind like it didn't exist. And in your hand, you would have six or eight little kernels of wheat. The chaff is all of that stuff that surrounded the wheat kernel. It was there. It looked big. It looked strong. It actually looks ten times bigger than the kernel of wheat. But as soon as you rub your hands on it, it just goes away. God's word says that the wicked are like chaff that are just blown away. And, and it sounds cruel, but the truth is, it's absolutely true. Because in reality, our lives here are just for a little while. And without God's purpose, without God's eternity, what do we have? Let's be real about this for a second. How many of you guys can tell me what the hair color of your great-great-grandfather was? Can you tell me whether or not he had acne when he was a kid? Can you tell me what his favorite food was? Can you tell me what his eye color was? The truth and the reality is I don't know. There's a decent chance that you don't either. Because in this world, we're only here for a little while. And if our purpose is built on us, everything that we do dies with us. When we die, our purpose dies with us. Without a life built on God, God has created us. See, our purpose dies with us. But when our life is built on God, the conversations that you have with people lead them to eternity. So that means they're eternal conversations. When you start to show people that God is still working and they get to lean into him too, that matters not just now, but it matters for eternity. Right? It's not just a short-term thing. Our lives are short, but they don't have to be. Our, our lives have value only because God gives them value. Do you realize there's seven and a half billion people in this world? Can you wrap your mind around seven and a half billion? I read something this week that's really interesting. You know how big a billion is? If you made, I think it said $3,600 a second, you would have to work 21 years nonstop to make a billion dollars. 
Any of you guys make $3,600 a second? We can talk after church. It'd be so nice. <laughs> right? You would have to work, what was it, 220 years, no, 30 years to make a billion dollars, 220 years in order to give one dollar to every person that's on this earth today. That's $3,600 a second. That's huge. That's a lot of people. When you think about it from the world's perspective, you think these people don't really matter. You wear t-shirts that say things like Thanos was right. Some of you guys will know what I'm talking about. But what if God values every one of those people? What if God looks at every one of those people and says they matter? And the only way that they're going to matter is if they do my purpose because my purpose is built on something bigger than just them. My purpose is built on changing this world and showing this world that I still love this world, showing this world that the brokenness and the sin of this world isn't going to get to win. Ultimately, Jesus died so that sin and death and darkness does not get to win, so that the worst of this world is not all that there ever is. Instead, we look at verse 6, for the, for the Lord knows the, way of, knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Instead, God builds a way for us. He knows our way that is different, and it lasts, and it lives. It doesn't die, even when we do, because we get to be in eternity with him, and the actions that we had from here will matter for eternity. So here's what I want you to do today. Cherish the word of God. Cherish the word like, like Micah chapter 6, verse 8. It's so simple. It says there, that he has told you, oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to, and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. To, to, to live lives that are just and kind and humble before God changes the world around us. Changes the world. And it brings a hope that this is not all that there is. So my bottom line is this. I'm going to close with this today. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you treasure God's word, your heart will be there. When you get to be the type of person who meditates on God's word, when you, when you uh, meditate on his will for your life instead of these other things, your heart will be there. And the brokenness and the anger and the things that so many of us deal with, we don't want to deal with anymore. They start to fade. So how do we do that? How do we own that? Simple thing. Decide your path. I like to hike. And occasionally, I'll just set out and I'll hike and I'll get myself in really stupid decisions. Uh, a couple years ago, I decided I wanted to just take the back way up to the top of the, uh, to the ridge in the Sandia. So I started in Carnuel. I just started like hiking up the side of the mountain, which was dumb. And I got to the top, realizing I didn't have enough water or food to be able to make it back down the way that I came without dying. So I ended up having to walk all the way back to Teharis from the top of the mountain. I walked from Carnuel to Teharis. Yes, it's dumb, right? I did that because I was unwise in my decisions. I got up and just started doing without knowing my path. How many days have we had that exact experience? Where we got up and we did what we wanted to do and we ended up at the end of the day thinking, man, I wish I never would have made those decisions. What we can do, and this is why this is so cool. My ch our challenge this month is that you will get up and you will get into God's word to start your day. Start your day in God's word. This is why we've got this going right here. The questions are still out there. You can grab them. Start your day in God's word. We're actually going to have a class here next month you can sign up for to be able to learn how to study God's word. Because we want every one of us to build our lives on a foundation that's not going to go away when things get hard. As Jesus says, he who, who keeps my teachings is like a man who builds his house on the rock. And when the rains come down, and the floods come up, when everything falls apart, his house will stand. So today, if you feel like your house is falling apart, let's change the foundation. Our mighty God, God, you are good to us, even though I'm not always good to you. God, I pray for every man and every woman in this room that, that our hearts would be contented with your will, for us, that we would find the joy that comes from you that's deeper than the quick dopamine drops of sin in this world. God, please comfort our hearts with you. I pray for forgiveness, that we would accept the forgiveness that comes from Jesus, and that we would build our lives on your foundation. Please, Lord, guide us step to step in this week. I ask in Jesus' name.